Welcome back. Undoubtedly, the stock of the morning has been Larson and Tubro. While the index itself is up, up and away, uh, LNT is doing a lot of the heavy lifting uh, along with Reliance. And uh, why not? The results announced yesterday were a handsome beat on almost every parameter. And it was the nature of the beat, beat by such a distance, as Jeffries tells us in their report, that the way in which the order book has grown, even with a 2% growth in order book, they, have, they will get their full year guidance and they have nine months, but uh, the company has refused uh, to immediately uh, give us a new set of guidance. The only crib is about uh, the margins, uh, which of course was explained in the conference call, but I'm going to hop a little more on that. Uh, since that's the only one to grumble about, let me welcome Mr. R. Shankar Raman, the whole time director at CFO at Larson and Dubro. Good morning, Mr. Shankar Raman. First of all, hearty congratulations, although I will start with the crib. Uh, it, it has been a handsome beat uh, on everything. Uh, okay, margins. Uh, you did point out in the conference call that uh, uh, the kind of it was the non uh, margin accretive projects that were being done, and they were also one when commodity prices were, or at least uh, the commodities were procured at high prices. But, uh, uh, you know, you said it'll be subdued for a couple of quarters. Can you tell us what you mean by subdued? Does it go below double digits? And when you say it'll improve in fourth quarter, how much can it? See, uh, Lata, the context of all the conversation around margin is uh, infra segment. Because I think the hydrocarbon segment and the manufacturing segments have actually reported improvement in margin. So let's possibly uh, uh, dive into the infra segment, which is where the margin pain is being experienced. Uh, when I mentioned about uh, absorption of costs that were committed uh, in the post-COVID, uh, post-war period, uh, what I meant was the mix of jobs that we are currently executing has jobs which have been uh, one in the last, uh, let's say, 12 months, and jobs which have been one in the 18 months prior. So typically we take about three years on an average to complete a project. So the mix is generally behaving in this uh, fashion. Uh, when we talk about non-margin accretive jobs, we are talking about the cost overrun we have had in the projects that we bagged in FI late part of FI21 and in FI22 where the cost commitments could not have been delayed beyond a point because end of the day, the project has to be completed to the customer. So waiting endlessly for costs to improve or inflation to come down would have been disastrous as an outcome for the company. So we waited as long as we could and then went ahead and uh, sort of bit in the bullet, committed the costs, and uh, that has enabled us to actually report growth in sales volume now. The, the momentum of sales growth that you see in the uh, last quarter of the last year and the first quarter of the current year is largely as a result of uh, execution pace picking up mm. so that we could complete uh, projects on the time committed to our customers. So it became inevitable that the jobs that we were executing had inherently diluted margins than what we yes. actually got into the contracts with. Now, this mix does not change overnight. Now, given the, the nature of uh, the project business and having a three, three and a half year life cycle for its completion, mm -hmm. the change in the mix would be gradual. So when mm -hmm. I say it will be subdued in the next couple of quarters, what I meant was it is not as though the last of the high cost have mm -hmm. gone out of the financial statements on 30th June. There are still possibly 20% of our revenue coming from jobs which have been affected by these inflationary pressures. And this 20% will come down to 10%, to 5%, to 0% over subsequent yes. quarters. So it's very important that the mix of jobs that we have acquired in the recent past starts contributing to revenue generation. And once that happens, the change in the margin profile will become an inevitable. No, outcome. sir, I understood it perfectly even when you explained at the conference call. What I'm only asking is that... This 20%, which you say are those uh, uh, because of the chronology, uh, non-accretive, will it take it below 10%, your margins? See, currently, we are at margin uh, construction uh, infrastructure business. We reported okay. a, a, a margin of 5.1%. Um, uh, Okay. Six and a half percent was the margin last year. I'm just talking about the mm. the, the infra piece. The construction business, yeah. Got uh, it. The P. 
Okay, the on a on a normalized basis, this segment has a potential to make about eight percent margin. Okay. When you mix it up with the manufacturing mm -hmm. activity that we have and the hydrocarbon business that we have, then the margin profile improves from the eight percent for infra segment to a blended average of nine nine quarter. That's okay. where the margins uh, will will be. Okay. So okay. our uh, efforts would be through the subsequent quarters discover our path back. Uh, okay. to those kinds of line. Our guidance for the year uh, given out in May was 9%. So okay. we've not... No, no. Yeah, you're referring to core margins. Okay, I get that. I get that. Okay, uh, let me, uh, uh, you know, get to the uh, uh, buyback, uh, though I have a lot more execution and project questions. Uh, you know, why the buyback? Your Look at the share performance over the last one year. It's a 50% rise. Let's pull up the one-year chart and you will get an idea. What were you all at? 1,700? 1,800? Yeah, uh, yeah, now, you yeah. know, already at 2,500, 2,600. And, you know, this buyback is will give you another 17, 16%, taking it to 3,000. If you kept the money with you, it would anyway go to 3,000. Look at the Jefferies and all of them. They're anyway giving you a share price. Why are you giving money away to shareholders? You all are doing a better job. Why didn't you keep it? Uh, Lata, uh, fortunately for us, even though there's a lot of stress in executing projects, it's not a very capital intensive business. And if we are very discreet and uh, thoughtful about capital allocation, the money would generate every year on a year on year basis is available for servicing debt, which is very low in our books. The entire group debt is uh, dominated by financial services debt. So if you exclude that, the debt levels are very low. So there is very little capital that is required to service the debt. Now, we are actually trustees of shareholders. And it is a company which is owned by everybody and anybody. Now, that yes. being the case, I think our job is to make sure that we add value to shareholders. Uh, and one way to do that would be to have healthy profits, healthy dividend. And whenever the surpluses are far higher than what the company requires, looking at the next couple of years, uh, you know, its own investment program, uh, and its own working capital requirements. The money is best given back to the shareholders. The whole idea mm -hmm. of our philosophy is that we work to shareholders' value creation. We do believe this is a good return that mm -hmm. uh, we would provide to the shareholders. Like they've okay. waited uh, yeah. for long, and as I told you, the first time ever in our history we've ever yes. been able to do this. Our belief is that we want to get onto a model which will be cash generative, and okay. hence we will have a program of a uh, dividend on a healthy continuous basis as well okay. as periodically we will have to see how buybacks can be done the share okay. price per se does not determine this philosophy the idea is God. we need to make sure we are high on roe and mm -hmm. we are able to have the shareholders uh, have money in their hands okay so you will soon be not just uh, uh, an eps generating company but also a yield generating company uh, I guess uh, people will make those calculations. Uh, since you're speaking about TPS and uh, the Laksha and the ROE uh, uh, you know, targets, let me come to some of the financial parts. MSCI has upgraded your, uh, your ESG rating to BB from B. Now, does, how does that work into the finances? Does that make it easier? I believe that you also have done a ESG audit of all your plants and you're working towards near uh, zero yeah. uh, living off the environment. So should we expect a lot of financial uh, gains from this? Uh, and by when? As, is, as I see it now, uh, what drives us toward ESG is our own sense of responsibility towards better planet. Um, I think uh, we are not looking at it merely from the point of view of how it would benefit financially. The cost of transition is a major topic world over. Uh, people are yet to figure out as to how this cost of transition would be financed. Ultimately, whether it will be channelized through government to public pocket is something that needs to be worked out. Uh, since we are in the business of construction and projects, etc., we inherently are carbon emitting operations. Mm. We, we cut trees, we, we, yeah. we do things, we actually destroy before we construct. So mm. this process of deconstruction has to be compensated. So consequently, what we have got us uh, working on is to see how to in decrease the emissions. So we have set ourselves targets year on year as to how to reduce emissions progressively. For yeah, example, sir. sourcing green power. No, sir, I got that. I way. got that. I, uh, forgive me. I'm sorry I'm interrupting you, but it's just that I'm trying to pack in more questions. I just want to know whether at the moment it impacts your cost of capital. I mean, 
how quickly will, it, will you see it in terms of gains, lower cost of capital? No, I don't think you will see it soon in terms of lower cost of capital, but it does a lot to our emotional capital. Oh, okay, okay. Got that. I'm sorry if I'm pushing you. It's just that I have, you, have, you have won so many brilliant projects that I wanted to speak a little more about the Neom Green Hydrogen uh, project as well. That's a huge one, uh, uh, isn't it? Even in terms of uh, the amount of money, what, over $2 billion. So, uh, is, do, do these projects from the Middle East come with higher margins? Uh, intrinsically, yes. It all depends on how smartly we execute the projects. Uh, because I think... Um, the price points of uh, markets outside India is definitely better. Uh, but the task of executing it in foreign land to comply with the foreign regulations, to make sure that you meet the localization requirements, etc., has its own cost impacts as well. But having said that, I think it is very important for us to get the kind of pre-qualifications we have got. As we speak, over $5 billion worth of solar green related projects we are executing in Middle East. And Saudi Arabia actually is one of the largest markets. So yeah. I think uh, we do believe that uh, we should be able to help uh, the margin accretion overall by executing these projects well. It has gone off to a good start. Uh, yeah. I must say that uh, we had a very rough start uh, oh. because as we got into these projects, the module prices, the polysilicon mm. prices, Crash. et cetera, yeah. shot through the roof. But then okay. since it was such a global phenomenon, the clients were understanding. So we were able to redraw the timeline, wait for things to cool and then move forward. So to that extent, we've been able to de-risk. So there are risks, as is the case with any projects in solar green projects as well. But we hope okay. that uh, wiser by all our past experiences, we will do a better okay. job. Okay. Well, I, I know reality is a small piece for you, but uh, it looks like you're coming with very ambitious and very uh, intelligent uh, 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 financing, if you please. This Capital Land India Trust Management, it's almost like self-financing your realty. And it also means a lot of office space and then the residential space that you have tied up with, with HDFC Capital Advisors. Together, can this contribute uh, to uh, LNT Skitty? Can you give any numbers and timelines? Uh, you know... Uh... At the moment, let me mention that uh, over 12 million square feet of residential area is under development and over 15 million square feet of um, uh, commercial area is under development. Our plan was to see how we can do about 50 million square feet. Uh, obviously, I think it is capital intensive business and you have to build, wait and then sell and realize the mm. cash. And that was going um, uh, contra to our ROE plans. So we decided that we will actually use the best part of our uh, skill sets, namely the design, engineering, construction, marketing, etc., and get somebody who can finance the acquisition mm. of the land and development of projects. And that's where the platforms that you spoke about come into play. So we will use the third parties uh, funds platform, uh, bring in our real estate development skills and uh, possibly get a return which will be high on ROI because our investment will be low, but it is definitely in absolute terms lower than what we would do had we put that in our balance sheet directly and done start mm. to finish. Okay, okay. Will you list it separately anytime soon? No, no, no. I don't think there is plan to do that. Okay. I think first we want to make sure that these uh, revised transformative uh, models actually work and uh, we would possibly look at it in the next uh, strategic plan perhaps. Okay. All right, uh, Mr. Shankaran, I'm not out of questions. I haven't even begun with Hyderabad and Nabha and uh, the other pro uh, projects, but this, we are in the thick of results season. So, Chartbusters is knocking at my head uh, to uh, wind up. Thank you very much. Pleasure. I'll take a rain check from you for another interview soon. Well, we leave Bazaar with the markets uh, absolutely flying high at the highest point of the day. Chartbusters takes the action. Forward.